All this is Dr. Mobeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So today we have one more rock star with us. So you know the lineup of rock stars. We have a world-renowned and leading expert of mast cell activation syndrome and its related diseases and the signs and symptoms and diagnosis and management of it. I think we all know that MCAS is something that is not very familiar to many uh, doctors and honestly diagnosing it is a is an issue as well so today we have the expert who can shed some light on it so the topic today we are going to discuss is mcas any possible connection to covid as well so before we go into those details let me quickly introduce you introduce to you the, the um, guest that we have today so i'm going to share my screen so we have Dr. Lawrence Afrin. He, so it is funny that I have done computer sciences as well and I'm graduated in there too. So after a BS in computer science in Clemson University, so he is a BS in computer sciences as well. In 1984, Dr. Afrin earned his MD at the Medical University of South Carolina in 1988, where he, had, he also pursued internal medicine residency and hematology oncology clinical and research fellowships on faculty at musc 1995 to 2014 he was active in medical education plus information technology and educational administration i love it information technology as well including hematology oncology fellowship director 1997 to 2010 and practice and research in hematology oncology and medical informatics since the mid zeros, his clinical work has increasingly focused on hematology, especially mast cell disease. He also directed MUSC's myeloproliferative neoplasms clinical trials program. Since 2014 to 17, spent furthering his interest in mast cell disease at the University of Minnesota, he has been developing an independent institute located in the greater New York City area for advancing care, research, and education in mast cell diseases. And, and thanks for that, Dr. Afrin. He also is working to develop a global investigation in, in, investigative network in his area. He has spoken widely in his area of focus. His extensive publication record includes some of the most highly accessed articles about mast cell activation syndrome and a popular book in this field. He has served on editorial board for several journals and medical advisory boards for various organizations, including the Mastocytosis Society. So I can tell you this, that when I announced that we'll have Dr. Afrin with us, the interest and the questions and the celebration was tremendous. I think one of the most celebrated guests we have today is Dr. Afrin. So Dr. Afrin, welcome to Dr. Bean and welcome to the community of Cool Beans. Thanks very much for the opportunity and the, uh, the introduction. Th that is your introduction. That is, I think you have done even more than what we saw here. Uh, so Dr. Afrin, tell us a little bit about what is your day-to-day -day nowadays? What is your work? What is happening? Um, my day-to-day -day is, uh, for the most part, uh, seeing uh, what seems to be an unending stream um, of patients who, um, for the most part, are not yet diagnosed with mast cell activation, but uh, largely through their own research, more so than their doctor's uh, research. Uh, they, they've come to suspect that mast cell activation may be what uh, has been underlying the chronic multi-system unwellness that they've been typically suffering for decades. Um, and unfortunately, uh, because this is uh, an entity which came to be recognized by our field so recently, and there are so few doctors who, are, who yet have familiarity with it, many patients find that um, they then have trouble finding a relatively local doctor to um, help them 
diagnose and manage it. And so sometimes they feel they have no choice but to uh, consult with, uh, you know, an, an expert who sometimes is located a, a great distance away. Um, so patients come to me, I help them uh, get evaluated and uh, we run through diagnostic testing. Um, and once, you know, if we're able to make a diagnosis, then I help them formulate a treatment plan. I actually do directly treat patients who live relatively close to my practice, but you know, I see many patients who come from great distances away, and I, I, I can't responsibly personally treat those patients, but I try to work with their local doctors, providing recommendations to their local doctors, and um, and then it's their local doctors who actually provide treatment. Got it. Thank you very much. And for the community, for the uh, audience here, uh, for the cool beans here, please uh, realize that Dr. Afrin has a tight schedule today. He has a patient he's going to see after one hour. So we're going to contain all this discussion within one hour. So the structure will be that first we will discuss mass cell activation, its possible link to COVID, if at all, and then we'll take your questions as well. There are tons of questions on Twitter. There are questions here as well. So I'm going to try to do as much of a justice as I can, given that we have shorter period of time. So with this, I'm going to continue with the discussion. So uh, once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Afrin. Tell me this. What are the, why is mast cell activation syndrome such a difficult thing to diagnose, number one? And number two, why do so many doctors not believe in it? As soon as they hear the word MCAS, they start, they start, you know, yeah. they have an expression that I think, you know, why is that? Well, um, doctors go through, as you well know, you know, we typically go through seven to 10 years of training. And in that time, um, out of 10 years, we get about one minute of teaching about mast cell biology and disease. Um, we are taught in that one minute, you know, extremely little about normal mast cell biology. Um, we're told that the mast cell produces perhaps a couple of mediators, tryptase and histamine. Um, and we're taught about, um, uh, we're, we're taught that uh, with regard to disease, we're taught that mast cells uh, are involved in allergy. And we're taught that there is this other uh, mast cell disease, the rare mast cell disease of mastocytosis. A, uh, a cancer of the mast cell, which fortunately usually is a pretty indolent uh, cancer. And that's all we're taught. And so I, th and, and then doctors finish training, they go into practice, they spend the next 30, 40 years in practice. And most of them will never, I mean, mastocytosis is so rare, most of them will never see a case of it. And so then if somebody tries to tell such a doctor that, oh, actually there's this other mast cell disease um, that um, actually is very prevalent, which obviously implies that the doctor actually has been seeing it throughout his whole career, but just couldn't recognize it even when it was in front of his face. Um, and, and furthermore, you tell them it's very prevalent and it can cause an immense array of, uh, you know, illnesses and problems. And this is totally opposite from what the doctor was taught during his training. Uh, so I can understand why the reflexic reaction of most doctors is to say, this is not possible. Um, but once a doctor begins to learn more about the known biology of these cells, you often see the light bulb turn on, uh, the proverbial light bulb turn on over his head very quickly. 
and he begins to realize, as I came to realize myself uh, a number of years ago, that actually these cells can cause far more problems than uh, I was ever taught. And you begin to realize the patterns of illness that this can present with that go far beyond what we were taught. And you begin to realize, yes, actually, I have been seeing this my whole career. I just couldn't previously recognize it for what it is. But once you can recognize it, then you can diagnose it because there is testing uh, for it. I'm not going to say it's the easiest uh, testing in the world, but there is testing. Uh, and once diagnosed, it can be treated. And fortunately, there actually are many treatments that have already been shown helpful in various mast cell patients. And I think it's a delight to any doctor who's long been troubled by mysteriously, chronically unwell patients, often coming to think their issues are purely psychosomatic, and I think it's a real relief um, and very enjoyable to the doctor when he suddenly realizes, no, this is not psychosomatic. There's a real biological problem here and I can prove it through the testing. And once it's proven, I can treat these patients. And my goodness, even though the patient has been so unwell in so many different ways for, for decades, if we just apply the right treatment for the right diagnosis, the patient actually usually starts getting significantly better and pretty quickly at that. So Got it. it's nice to see. Got it. So, so tell me this. Imagine if I'm a doctor who does not know about MCAS that well. When I encounter a patient, what are the indicators? You, you touched on some of them. What are the indicators that should at least make me suspicious? It's a great so question. You know what I should think in terms of MCAS. Yeah, great question. And probably my best piece of advice is to the doctor is just stop for a moment. Stop and think. Try to distance yourself from the particulars, the individual little things. These patients often come in with a very long and long established problem list. And if, if all you do is focus in on one problem, a chief complaint, so to speak, and ignore everything else, you're probably gonna miss what's sitting right in front of your eyes. The mast cell actually produces more than a thousand mediators and the symptoms that any given patient has are consequent to the particular pattern of inappropriate mediator release that's being seen in the individual patient. But it's a very different pattern from one patient to the next. So the particulars of the symptoms and findings that you see from one mast cell patient to the next usually are quite different, but actually, there are some common themes to these mediators. So the first theme, what I, I've come to learn is the universal constant with this disease is chronic multi-system inflammation. Every mast cell patient has chronic multi-system inflammation. So if the problem list has many items on it that end in itis, 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 you know, inflammation, inflammation, inflammation in one system, one tissue, one organ after another. That's one clue right there. But there are a couple of other themes that we see too. Uh, so it's chronic multi-system inflammation plus minus um, allergic type phenomena, which could be just classic allergies or could be some other allergy related phenomena like uh, urticaria or angioedema. Uh, and I say plus minus because there are many mast cell patients who do not have a speck of allergy to them. And then at the opposite end of that enormous spectrum, there are those few unfortunate mast cell patients who are in 24 by seven anaphylaxis. And every other mast cell patient is somewhere in between those extremes on the allergy spectrum. 
And there's one other plus minus uh, theme to this that's actually the hardest to recognize because it emerges at the slowest pace. And that is plus minus abnormalities in growth and development, what we call dystrophisms, in potentially any tissue in the body. And these come about because some of the mast cell mediators are integrally involved in guiding growth and development in all tissues in the body. So those are the three broad themes. There certainly are a lot of other symptoms that can be seen with these patients that don't neatly fit into any of those categories. But if you step back for a moment, look at the big picture, and you see this pattern of multi-system inflammation and allergy and possibly some dystrophisms, and then you stop to ask yourself, what's more likely? Is this patient really so uniquely unlucky as to have coincidentally acquired so many different problems? Uh, all of them developing independently of one another, or is it more likely they've got one thing going on that actually can is biologically capable of causing, either directly or indirectly, most or all, probably all, of what's long been going on with the patient. And obviously, the, the scientific principle we're talking about here is Occam's razor, and it is more likely that there is one unifying explanation. We used to not know for any such disease, uh, any disease that could account for such a wide range of problems, but now we understand that there is this entity called mast cell activation syndrome, and it's actually very prevalent. It's just very difficult to learn to recognize because it shows up at a superficial level looking so different from one patient to the next to the next. Got it. Thank you very much. So if I wanted to uh, complete this thought for the healthcare professionals who are watching, there are lots of uh, non-healthcare professionals or uh, people who are watching as well. But for healthcare professionals, so let's say you have uh, alarmed me, alerted me enough to say, all right, here are some categories and suspect mast cell. If I'm suspecting it, what is my next step? How do I diagnose? How good, do I then manage? Yeah, good question. Uh, excellent question. Let, let me first uh, just provide a point of clarity. I am certainly not saying that every chronically, mysteriously unwell patient has mast cell disease at the root of it. Um, but it is turning out that this is a prevalent disease. So many of the patients with the broad presentation uh, themes that I've described, many of them are turning out to have mast cell activation once you can prove it. So that gets to your question. And the testing for this, I'll be the first to acknowledge, it's, uh, it's not easy. Um, for example, in general, we, we like to find not only a history that is consistent with chronic uh, inappropriate mast cell mediator release, uh, and of course we want to do a careful differential diagnosis and do our best to make sure the patient doesn't have any other disease that could better account for the particular array of difficulties that patient has had. But then we want to find um, laboratory evidence of mast cell activation. And for the most part, uh, that's looking for elevated levels in the blood or the urine of these various mediators. Uh, but we want to look for mediators that are relatively specific to the mast cell. Yes, the mast cell produces a great many mediators, but most of them are not particularly specific to the mast cell. So finding elevated levels of them won't clarify for you that it's really a mast cell disease. Uh, so in the end, there are roughly a couple of handfuls of mediators that are fairly specific uh, to the mast cell, and those are the ones we want to test for in blood or urine or both, but it's challenging because most of these mediators are very sensitive to heat. Um, and unless uh, both the patient and the laboratory staff take care to keep the samples uh, continuously chilled, not just when the samples are being taken from the patient, but 
many of these tests are specialized tests that are only going to be performed in very distantly located reference laboratories. So sometimes the samples have to be shipped great distances and the laboratory staff have to take care to carefully pack the, uh, the specimens so that they will remain continuously chilled uh, until they finally get to the machine that's going to give us the answer. Uh, so testing can be challenging. I, so I won't call it easy, but I will call it straightforward. Once you learn the various mediators that are appropriate to check for this disease, uh, they, they can be ordered in most, uh, at least first and, and second world uh, countries around the world. Um, and you pursue the testing. And sometimes, again, it's technically challenging testing. So sometimes you do have to repeat uh, testing. Sometimes you get back results and you can tell from the results, nah, there was a problem with the handling of the specimens. Uh, so you repeat the testing. But in general, what I found, and I guess this is no surprise, is that if the patient clinically presents in a fashion suggestive of chronic inappropriate mast cell activation. And then if you pursue the testing and you handle the testing in the manner that's appropriate for these sensitive specimens, then you pretty reliably can find elevated levels of these various mediators that tell you, that they give you the confirmation. Yeah, yes, this really is a situation of inappropriate mast cell activation. And then you get into treatment. Yes. So I was going to ask you about that. So let's say I suspected a patient of mast cell. I got some labs. They may have come back with things that tell me it is or they're not, and the labs may be right or wrong. I want to test out some management now. How do I approach management? Let me briefly review with you the three major principles for successfully managing this disease and then the three steps to uh, uh, taking care of these patients. The principles uh, are patience, persistence, and a very methodical approach in stepping through the, the various treatments that have been found helpful in these patients. Uh, you know, it's very fortunate that we actually have found so many different treatments already that help these patients. It's just unfortunate that the state of the science in this area is so immature that we've not yet identified any reliable methods for predicting which of these many treatments will best help uh, the individual patient. So it sometimes takes trials of a number of different mast cell targeted drugs before one finds the particular drugs that are going to best control the particular variant of this highly variable disease that the individual patient has come to acquire. So patients persist. Every drug that's tried for this disease, or I should say almost every drug that's tried for this disease, it only takes about a month to figure out if it's going to be significantly helpful or not. Uh, so one doesn't have to dwell for very long on drugs which don't appear to be helpful. So the principles, patience, persistence, a methodical approach, you want to try to make one change in the patient's regimen at a time as much as is possible because the moment the doctor or the patient starts making multiple changes around the same time and the patient then gets either better or worse, nobody's going to know which change is making the patient better or worse. So yes, there sometimes are emergencies where you have to make multiple changes at the same time, but for the most part, there's the time available to make one change at a time. So those are the principles, the steps very quickly. Step one, identify the patient's triggers as precisely as possible and then do one's best to avoid them because it's actually kind of difficult for any drug to gain good sustained control over dysfunctional mast cells when the patient 
is simultaneously and persistently ingesting or otherwise exposing herself to a trigger. So step one, identify and avoid triggers as best you can. I know this is often quite difficult, but you do the best you can. Step two, identify the optimal antihistamine regimen. We, we start there because we know that some combination of H1 and H2 blockers um, usually do significantly help uh, these patients. It's often a very different combination that turns out to be the optimal antihistamine regimen in the individual patient. Um, but antihistamines are step two. And beyond that, uh, as I like to describe to my patients, steps three through N or to try, 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 and then try some more of the many other drugs which have been found helpful in various mast cell patients. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. This is actually excellent. So this part of the discussion, it packages up for a doctor to understand that a patient might have mast cell activation syndrome as a differential diagnosis with their symptoms, and then how to approach the labs and how to approach the management. Now, I want to ask one more question. And before I continue with the COVID questions, I, I have a few questions here, both YouTube as well and Twitter too, and common, some of the common questions. Is it actually possible with the mast cell activation syndrome to have burning eyes, one? And somebody over here said, uh, uh, issues with the ear, issues with the skin. Um, let me read one more. Um, then the tongue dryness, burning lips, throat and nose issues. Uh, are those all, if they are happening, they, can they, say they, that? They, yes, they, they can be. But the best way to answer that question is to back up to, to a higher level and ask yourself, where are the mast cells in the body? And in truth, they're in every tissue in the body, but they're dominantly sighted at the environmental interfaces. So the skin, the respiratory tract, the, the GI tract, the genitourinary tract, and yes, all the mucosal surfaces. So the eyes, the ears, the mouth, um, absolutely. All of the symptoms you described uh, are actually often seen in patients who have um, mast cell activation. Got it. Got it. So now, uh, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, now let's uh, move towards COVID. So we had discussed here, cool beans, we are about a million folks who discuss various studies and conjectures and hypotheses for COVID and we've been doing it for 15 months. We, we discussed your uh, hypothesis as well. So what is the possible relationship of mast cell activation to COVID? And I'll give you just very quickly my own experience with the long COVID. There is a category of patients who would not respond to other managements, but as soon as we do mast cell activation syndrome management, they start improving. So what is the relationship there? It's a great question. I don't know that we really know a definitive answer to that yet, but as you know, I published, a, along with uh, some eminent co-authors, I published uh, a hypothesis uh, last fall um, about that. Uh, my colleagues and I uh, were recognizing from early in the pandemic there were some curious patterns in the pandemic um, that um, seemed to align fairly well with the patterns we had, you know, long come to uh, experience in our mast cell uh, patients. Um, it, 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 just a couple of things. Number one, why is it that uh, you know, fifteen to twenty percent? of the patients developing the acute infection were developing unusually severe forms of the infection, what came to be called the hyperinflammatory cytokine storms that often was what actually took their lives. Um, it, um, it wasn't so much the, the load of the virus in their bodies, it was the vigor 
uh, of the inflammatory response to the virus that was causing so much damage in various organ systems that was taking these patients' lives. But why was it just 15 to 20 percent of patients? Uh, what, what was different about those patients compared to the other 80, 85 percent that were having, uh, shall we say, mild to moderate forms of the infection? Um, and furthermore, why was it that uh, some non-trivial proportion of COVID infection survivors, um, various estimates anywhere from about 20 to uh, roughly uh, 30, uh, 40%, uh, 20 to 40% of COVID survivors uh, might have uh, long haul syndrome. Uh, but if you look at the pattern of the symptoms in long haul syndrome, quite often what you see in these patients is a pattern somewhat similar to the broad pattern I described before for mast cell activation. You see chronic multi-system um, inflammation, plus minus allergic type issues, and sometimes even some dystrophic uh, issues. And so uh, when you fit these observations together with the knowledge that has emerged in the last few years from preliminary research in the MCAS arena, that it actually seems to be about 17% of the general first world population that likely has MCAS. Um, well, that kind of fits fairly well with the 15 to 20% of acute COVID infections uh, and COVID infected patients who are developing severe forms of the syndrome. And um, again, the patterns of the long haul uh, symptoms are, are fitting fairly well with what we see with, with uh, MCAS patients. And so the thought then emerges Maybe what's distinguishing these, um, these severe acute COVID patients and the long haul COVID patients is that many of them might actually have already had MCAS in place for some time, uh, potentially even for decades before they developed the COVID infection. Um, it could easily have been a very modest form of, of MCAS, doesn't have to be a severe form, but nevertheless, if there were dysfunctional mast cells already present in the patient at the time they got infected, then it could easily be those mast cells which were principally driving a wildly inappropriate response to the infection pouring out uh, all of these inflammatory mediators, causing this hyper-inflammatory cytokine storm. Um, and furthermore, since the natural history of mast cell activation syndrome, it, um, it tends to be fairly stable for long periods of time. There's always some ups and downs with it, but the baseline tends to be fairly stable for long periods of time. But then from time to time throughout a mast cell patient's life, the disease can fairly suddenly significantly escalate in its baseline level of misbehavior of the dysfunctional mast cells. But when these escalations I use that word to distinguish from just a brief little flare of the disease. When an escalation emerges, it tends to shortly follow uh, by anywhere from a few days to at most a few months, shortly follow a major uh, stressor, either a major physical stressor or a major psychological or emotional stressor. And one cannot deny that a COVID infection is a major stressor. So maybe what's going on with the long haul syndrome is, uh, again, the mass, the dysfunctional mast cells were already there, uh, whether it was recognized or not. But then the patient suffered a major stressor in the form of COVID infection. At that point, the baseline level of misbehavior of those dysfunctional mast cells significantly escalated. And now 
we're seeing all the symptoms of heightened mast cell, uh, heightened inappropriate mast cell activation that's coming to be clinically recognized as what we label as long haul syndrome. And I too, like you, have now seen a good number of patients who would be clinically labeled with long haul syndrome. And when we apply uh, mast cell targeted treatment, finally we see uh, actually fairly promptly uh, see uh, some nice settling of those symptoms. So, uh, and, and when we do the testing in those patients, we can actually prove that they, they do have uh, mast cell activation. Got it. Thank you very much. So one more question, which I'm seeing here on the YouTube side. From a patient's point of view, who is going to a doctor, they may not have yet figured out this may be mast cell. They may not have started those treatments. What is, in terms of food, nutrition, environment, some over-the-counter, what is something that patient can do to at least start curtailing this situation by the time that their doctor becomes more, uh, you know, uh, aware by labs to start managing them? Well, again, um, I, I think it starts with step one to try one's best to identify one's triggers as precisely as possible and then do one's best to um, avoid them. Um, uh, you know, some people find that uh, reducing the histamine content of their diet sometimes can be helpful. Uh, but I'll also note that in many mast cell patients, those maneuvers don't really provide any benefit. I haven't figured out yet how to reliably predict which patients are going to respond to any particular mast cell targeted treatment. But if you're talking about things that would be, there'd be little risk, either medical risk or financial risk for trying before one has a diagnosis, then attempts to identify and eliminate triggers, that's, that's easy. Uh, to at least try, um, and one can try altering diet if you come to think there are certain elements in your diet that are reliably provocative, uh, you know, triggering a flaring of symptoms, then there's certainly not much harm in making at least some modest uh, dietary adjustments to see if that'll make uh, a difference. And finally, regarding environment, um, again, if you come to recognize there are factors in the environment uh, that are reliably worsening symptoms for, uh, you know, perhaps there's a, a particular personal hygiene product like a soap or a shampoo or a toothpaste that is reliably worsening symptoms or maybe um, a particular room in the house uh, that you go into and very quickly you start having worsened symptoms. Uh, you might have to wonder whether there's some material um, in uh, some textile or, or some type of wood or maybe some cleaning agent that had been used in that area of the house or maybe there's even uh, an infestation of some sort. Um, uh, you know, mold, for example, um, uh, that might be infesting, uh, say, a bathroom. Um, so these are the things one can look for and try to address even before you necessarily have a clear diagnosis. Um, but still, all of that having been said, I think if you get to the point where you're coming to suspect there might might be a mast cell activation problem, then it's probably also a good idea to start looking relatively early for physicians in the local area that would be willing to work with you on trying to, to figure out whether there really is a mast cell activation problem. Again, there are many treatments for this disease, and what you don't want to do is start heading down a potentially long and expensive therapeutic path 
when it turns out you don't really have this diagnosis. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. Can people just go and buy, let's say, Allegra over the counter and try that out or not a good idea? Well, you know, the H1 and H2 blockers, for the most part, are available over the counter because they pose little, you know, medical or financial risk. Um, uh, but I think if somebody is going to do that without having a diagnosis yet, without having consulted uh, a physician regarding even a suspicion that they have mast cell disease, then I think if they're going to try that, they better stick very closely to the manufacturer's uh, dosing recommendations uh, for that product. Um, because the, the, the manufacturer has, uh, has determined through extensive study uh, and, and the product has been approved by the FDA with the, the recommended dosing because it's understood that at that level of dosing, the product ought to be safe. Even if it turns out to not be helpful, at least it will be safe. So I would really recommend patients stick to manufacture recommended uh, dosing if they do not have clarity yet as to uh, a, a diagnosis of mast cell disease. That, that's a very important point. Thank you very much. And and to the listeners, please do consult with your doctor. This is not a medical advice. It's more of an educational discussion. Consult with your doctor. See what is the right thing to do and then go from there. Uh, so Dr. Afrin, thank you very much for these discussions. If you are okay, um, we have 20 more minutes or, or a little lesser than that. I'm going to ask you some questions that Cool Beans have been leaving here as well. So first of all, they've been raving about your book and they have been raving about your uh, your expertise in this area, your leadership in this area. So I'm, I'm so honored that you have joined us and you have increased the ambience of our neighborhood. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, so cool beans, because we only have 20 minutes and I have to divide the questions. So I'm going to try some from YouTube and some from um, Twitter as well. So let's start with the YouTube. We have... Luis Grande here. Question, will we get to, to a specific MCAS test sometime in the near future, or will it remain a set of tests to try and narrow down a broad spectrum syndrome? Actually, I think the real answer to that question is neither of those options. I think we will get to specific testing for MCAS that will wind up being much simpler uh, much more straightforward, much easier, um, uh, much more economical than present testing. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen in the near future. Now, this is a bit of semantics. How do you define near future versus far future? I'm optimistic uh, that in time, and this likely is going to be a decade or more away, could easily be two decades or more away, that we will get to a point where some fairly specialized genetic testing will actually be the best uh, indicator, uh, diagnostic indicator of this disease. And this testing can presently be done in a very few research laboratories around the world. Uh, but it's not presently available in any clinical laboratories, and I suspect it's going to be a long time before that testing migrates from the research laboratory to the clinical laboratory, and until then, testing will need to remain the somewhat laborious um, approach that I previously uh, described. Got it. That's actually a very important point. Thank you very much for that. So we have Dr. Yeo. Dr. Yeo works with, so he's an anesthesiologist, he's a friend of mine. He works with Dr. Bruce Patterson as well. I think you may know Dr. Bruce from the Dr. Tina Pierce conference in which you were presenting as well. So Dr. Yeo has a question for you. Is it true that Dr. Afrin was named after this nasal spray? It is not true. I think <laughs> Dr. Yeo true. made that up. Um, <laughs> I have... Uh, uh, the, the product was not named after me, and I was not named after the product. I have absolutely no connection 
to the product. If I did, I would think the royalties uh, would be enough for me to be uh, relaxing on a private island in the South Pacific. But since I'm here and not in the South Pacific, uh, I think that's all the evidence you need that I have no connection to that product. <laughs> Got it. Thank you very much for the evidence as well. So Dr. Afrin, so AVOX, Mocha Bean says, Dear Dr. Afrin, I did some homework to get ready for your talk. You wrote the menagerie of more than 1,000 mediators known to be produced by mast cells. Can you say a bit more about what's known about why so many and why why they all uh, what they all do please right well as to what so they all do yeah i'm sorry go ahead no sorry i was just going to repeat right. this so, sorry. as to what they all do you know we talked about this uh, uh, briefly before you know the general themes of driving uh, clinical phenomena that we would recognize as inflammatory phenomena. Obviously, the specific symptoms are going to be somewhat different depending on which organ system uh, is suffering the inflammation. But inflammatory phenomena, allergic type phenomena, uh, and tissue, um, uh, you know, growth and development abnormalities. There are other phenomena that really don't fit neatly into those categories. For example, many of these patients um, are quite easy to bruise and bleed. Uh, they may have excessive menstrual bleeding, for example, uh, or occasional nosebleeds for which some other source can't be found. Or they have uh, very easy bruising, bruises popping up now and then with no apparent uh, cause. And there actually are a number of pathways, biological pathways that mast cell activation uh, can um, intersect with the coagulation system to lead to these bleeding problems. So a vast array of um, uh, clinical um phenomena that can be seen with this disease uh, as to why the mast cells produce so many different meters. Ah, that, that's the really interesting question. And it actually uh, stems back to evolutionary biology. Uh, it turns out, uh, and, and there are scientists, um, so-called paleogeneticists, who have worked this out. But it turns out that um, as multicellular life was first evolving, um, the, the, there had to be some cell, some type of cell in the multicellular organism that was principally responsible for defense, for defending the organism against a very hostile environment. And it turns out that it was the ancestor of the mast cell that was the original host defense cell in multicellular organisms. And for hundreds of millions of years, the only defense cells we had were these ancestors of the mast cells. And given how many threats are out there in the environment, you can well envision how the mast cell had to acquire uh, quite the array of uh, weapons and, and tricks uh, for defending the organism against uh, assaults so that the organism could survive and produce the next generation and continue evolving. Over vast amounts of time, other types of defense cells uh, began to emerge, uh, neutrophils, macrophages, uh, lymphocytes, and so on and so forth, each of them uh, much more specialized in its uh, defense capabilities than the mast cell. The mast cell remained the jack of all trades. These other cells were more specialized. They actually accomplished their specialty in defense much better than the mast cell did, but the mast cell still persisted there as a jack of all trades. So fast forward 500 million years, and here we are in the modern era, we still have mast cells. They still have remembered all of their old tricks, 
but we also have all these other much more specialized cells that do their individualized jobs much better. And that's why you have much greater numbers of these more specialized cells and very few numbers, uh, relatively speaking, of the mast cells. That's a fascinating story. Thank you very much. Uh, very quick question before I ask the next question. Uh, Texas Meg says, uh, Dr. Afrin, spirit animal. That's a question for me? That's a question for <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> All right, so we'll continue. Uh, Virginia Phillips says, steroids have been used due to so many reactions that I have developed secondary adrenal insufficiency. Is this something that is common now with MCAS? Well, I think it's uh, reasonable to say that when a doctor is having to deal for a long period of time, years, even decades, with a patient who obviously is chronically inflamed, often suffering acute flares of that inflammation on top of the chronic inflammation, and yet no underlying cause can be identified, then it's understandable how the doctor could come to often apply the very potently anti-inflammatory steroids of one sort or another to those patients, particularly when they're having flares. But once the specific diagnosis of mast cell activation is identified and the doctor then realizes, and sometimes even the patient realizes, actually there's a vast array of other uh, treatments besides steroids that often can quite nicely gain control over the mast cell misbehavior, then we're able to shift uh, treatment to these other um, uh, medications and uh, reduce um, and, and often eliminate uh, any use of steroids. Got it. Thank you very much. So before the next question here, a doctor had sent me a note separately saying that one of their patients have burning eyes and irritating eyes after the uh, COVID or the vaccine. And number one, can it be mass cell activation? In addition to that, they have dry tongue as well and some skin itches as well. Number two, they said, when they are managing that patient, they give them antihistamine drops and, and you know, those tears, but that has not worked. How, what is the right approach for patients who have eye irritation and issues uh, possibly due to mast cells? Well, again, if, if one can demonstrate that there really is mast cell activation present, then there are some other topical treatments, uh, topical uh, uh, other mast cell targeted drugs which are available for topical application to the eyes uh, in eye drop form. Uh, for example, there are chromalin eye drops, there are catodophan eye drops, um, so, uh, and, and just because a patient fails to respond to one particular H1 blocker eye drop, uh, doesn't necessarily mean they'll fail to respond to a different type of H1 blocker. So say, for example, the patient fails to respond to azelastine eye drops, uh, then one could try olopatadine, uh, eye drops or, or vice versa. Um, so um, you, you, you've got, you know, a number of options there. But in addition to the, the topical, uh, you know, the focal treatments, let's keep in mind, too, that there's easily uh, potential for any systemic mast cell targeted therapy to gain control, you know, not only in the, uh, the ocular tissues, but a wide range of other tissues throughout the body too. So it could be uh, any of a, a vast array of other systemic therapies that might wind up being able to help the eyes uh, too. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I know that we are short on time. We, you just have five more minutes. 
even lesser than that. So two more questions. One quick one. What is your favorite snack? Yagami's nut sack is asking, what is your favorite snack? I don't know that I have one. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm enough. sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. One <laughs> last question. And I really apologize to the cool beans. We are short on time. I'm trying to do as good as I can. I know there are hundreds of more questions in both places. We'll request if we maybe possibly have Dr. Afrin once more with us. So let's ask the last question. Virginia Phillips says, I got MCAS or mold toxicity, but have since detoxed and have a better quality of life, but still recovering. Can CD117 be elevated from the mass MCAS, but later be decreased in number after healing the body or do the cells just remain in number, but in a calmer state? Mast cells actually do have a limited lifespan. Uh, mast cells typically survive about two to four years before uh, naturally passing and then coming to be replaced by fresh mast cells. Um, so there, there's just that natural clock um, in there. Um, the, 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 the number of CD117 molecules on the surface of a mast cell is probably relatively uniform across all the different mast cells in a patient's uh, body. Um, the issue perhaps more is how many mast cells are present in any one tissue or another. Um, in a mast cell patient's body. Keep in mind that in the rare mast cell cancer of mastocytosis, there are hugely increased numbers of mast cells. We don't see that in mast cell activation syndrome. We do often see a, a, a modest elevation in mast cell count uh, in various tissues, such as in the GI tract in patients with mast cell activation syndrome. But let's keep in mind um, the fundamental issue in mast cell activation syndrome is not the number of mast cells in the patient's body regardless of whether it's increased or not. The issue is whether th those mast cells that are present in the patient's body are inappropriately activated. That's the essence of what's going on in this disease. It, it's inappropriate, it's chronic inappropriate activation. Uh, some of that activation, some of that inappropriate activation is baseline, uh, it's just constant, 24 by 7, whereas other aspects to the inappropriate activation are reactive. So when the mast cell gets confronted by some trigger that ordinarily would not provoke um, much or any of a response from the mast cell, but in the dysfunctional mast cell, aha, that trigger is provoking a much more vigorous unhealthy, inappropriate reaction. So you have both baseline, what we call constitutive, as well as reactive, uh, inappropriate activation of the mast cells. That's the fundamental issue in this disease. Got it. So with this, uh, Dr. Afrin, once again, thank you very much for being here. For the cool beans, just like I had requested you to buy that book, Chronic, by Dr. Steve Phillips, this is another book, Never Bet Against Occam, and that is by Dr. Lawrence Afrin. He is here. This is a beautiful book, an important book, and I think we should all read it, regardless of being a, a healthcare professional or not. It would not only help us improve our quality of life, it actually can help our doctors understand us and our problems a little better as well. So uh, with this, uh, Dr. Afrin, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we totally appreciate your time. We hope and we pray that you can come back once more. We have tons of more questions too, but thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, happy to return, um, you know, when, when it works out. Perfect. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. You're welcome. Bye.